Welcome to One World Stories, uh, today episode 17. My name is Joanna Zell and I'm really, really thrilled to welcome a very precious guest of mine, George Simons. Hi, George. Hi, how are you, Joanna? I'm fine, how are you? Not bad, not bad for an old guy. <laughs> I love your background, or better say foreground, because you are on TV. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, the background is, I, see, I'm hiding my messy house, so all the people <laughs> don't, don't see it. But my, my house, I, I think I mentioned to you once before that um, uh, I had a friend whose daughter was studying uh, interior decorating, and I asked her the question, what is the style of my house, would you okay. say? And she said, hmm, early natural history museum. <laughs> <laughs> you can see over my head, there's a mask from Haiti, a flute from Peru, an, uh, an ax from New Zealand, a medicine jar from, uh, from Indonesia, and just goes on and on if you go around. My, my story is on my walls of my house. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. So let me uh, tell a little bit of the background information to all the people who watch us. So as you see, George is a wonderful storyteller. George is an artist, a poet. He writes haikus and he writes really, really, really lots of uh, poetry. Uh, and not only poetry, also fantastic books. Uh, I'm really thrilled to hear more about your next project, uh, George, in a minute. George is a co-creator of Diversophy, and this is how we actually met, because we met uh, years ago, 2013, at the Seattle Conference in Tallinn. And back then, I remember I attended your workshop, and I was really on the, in the seventh heaven, you know, <laughs> because I said, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, you, back then, you put so much emphasis on working with stories and working with narratives and also approaching such complex themes, uh, for example, multicultural identity, uh, dealing with, um, misunderstandings, conflicts uh, in the intercultural field with sharing stories, not with the cultural dimensions that were, let's say, the mainstream, or maybe not the mainstream any longer. However, were very, very, uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, very much discussed, let's say, and applied. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, this is really fantastic. And uh, then when I uh, got to know diversity as well, so your game, your intercultural game, I was again, once again, really thrilled when you contacted me and uh, invited me to cooperation and to write diversity Poland. So to combine the narrative methods, the narrative approach with uh, this idea of entertainment, so learning by playing. And uh, back then, by the way, uh, I still remember I was sitting with two friends of mine, one from Mexico, the other from Peru, in a nice uh, bar in Dubai when you called me and you said, ah, what about diversity? How, how do you feel about it? Do you, do you really uh, want to co-create it? And uh, yes, I was really, really uh, thankful and I love this idea. And this is uh, just one of the games because you've got such a huge repertoire of the games on different countries, different diversity issues, different languages as well. And uh, both of us, we had also this possibility to uh, prepare also and to offer the pre-Congress workshops on how to apply edutainment uh, diversity. So, you know, I, I could go on and on and on for, for uh, minutes and hours, and it's not the point. Uh, George, what does your heart beat for? What does my heart beat for? Wow. <laughs> I, I, I think you were, you were asking about one word uh, <laughs> in your series here, and uh, the word is fleur. I live in France, so that means flowers, for those who don't speak French. D 
the Blumen, yes. Um, and um, that's a really important word for me because a lot of my history is wrapped up in it. But I, I'd like to start with most recently, I, I sort of rediscovered the flowers and myself due to the lockdown from the pandemic. What happened was that the pandemic made us stay at home. And lucky me, I live in an apartment complex with lots of green space. And my neighbors love to plant flowers of all different colors and so on. So just walking out of my building and walking along the front of the other buildings, and we have a little woods out back and so on, I just felt so grateful. And I started spending time doing that, not just walking, but really noticing. So I think one of the things that the pandemic has given us is a refocused attention uh, on things that we, you know, in our hurried life beforehand, we passed back and forth. My haiku for you is pluck words like flowers. Poetry a manly art, and my bouquet for you. And um, I have a, a, a lover um, uh, whose name is Rosie, and uh, Rosie is a large red rose bush. And Rosie has a lot of meaning for me because uh, when I was a little kid, my grandfather uh, loved to, to cultivate gardens and particularly roses. So I got just enamored of the red roses. And then, of course, I, my first love uh, in life in grade school in the seventh grade was Rosie, a girl by the name of Rosie. Uh, the, the relationship never went much further than sitting on the swing in the, in the grape arbor and holding hands once. But um, at any case, uh, you know, when I go for a walk, I stop and I, I talk to the rose. You know, you're doing nice today. Oh, you've got some new blooms. Uh, yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it's a real joy. And um, in these days when we, uh, uh, you know, uh, we spend a lot more time, in a sense, with each other, but virtually most of the time. So it's uh, the, 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 the realities of, you know, the stuff hanging on my walls, even... I've become to appreciate my own apartment much better, you know. There's a picture of my dad with his best buddy out fishing on a boat. And there's a, a portrait, a collage of Leonard Cohen, whose, whose music and lyrics and poetry I truly love. I mean, uh, and his, the, the, uh, the saying of his from the, the song Anthem has become a motive or a slogan for me, and that is, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And the way our world is broken apart uh, due to the pandemic, we're beginning to realize what we as interculturalists call the meta narratives, the big socially constructed stories that we've been living by. And we see what's missing, what's hurting, uh, and we, we don't want to go back to the old normal. We want to use the light that's given to us by all of this breaking up to build something better and more beautiful. And you mentioned earlier about um, uh, diversity and telling stories and <clears throat> that sort. Basically, telling our stories brings us together. And we're learning from the people who do the neuroscience, that when we share something artistic, um, well, it's hard to define the borders of art, but a poetry, a song, a symphony, when we share that, our neurons become aligned. Literally, you and I become connected in a new way. And that's why I feel that storytelling, poetry, um, sh sharing music together, seeing art together, those connect us in an unconscious but very powerful way, which means that we are a little closer to discussing the things that divide us. 
the things that we're in conflict over. We have a little more ground to stand on to speak meaningfully to each other. And developing that capacity and the use of those things, I think is extremely, extremely important. I have a couple of heroes around in the intercultural field. One of them is May Gwynn, you know May, who has written a lot about neuroscience and culture. And one of the points she makes in her latest book is that we've spent our time as interculturalists doing a lot of how do we kiss, bow, and shake hands. Now, that was a good book when it came out, and it's, it still has some useful information in it. But the point is, much of our work has been about avoiding conflict, avoiding failure, making mistakes. And what May points out is that the real work is sharing the treasures that each of us brings with us from our own history, from our own story, from our cultural stories, and so on. And at the same time, that helps us examine uh, what's broken and lets the light shine in so we can go on to that much, much further. So uh, one of the other people who's done some very interesting work in this is um, a colleague in Canada, uh, Paul Schaefer. And Paul has written several books on art and culture. He's had a long career of being involved in cultural um, affairs. You know, we used to make a distinction in, in uh, the intercultural field about culture with a big C and culture with a little C, you know, comparing the theory and uh, the uh, development of the cultural dynamics and the concrete culture of the music, the dance, the, the, the way we work, all, all of the things that we, that, that actually are how culture is working. And his point is exactly what I was trying to say before, that culture is the way to the future. Uh, we, we, we have thought that, you know, rational argument, which has its uses, uh, would solve all these things. Getting the facts would solve all these things. But what we've learned is that those are important, but the only way to communicate them effectively is to become a what um, uh, Leotard, the, the French sociologist, calls being a cultural intermediary. And that means you're the kind of person who can take an idea or even a product in, in business huh? and so frame it, so tell its story that it corresponds to what you have in your background, in your automatic system, and you say, of course, okay? So that kind of influence, I mean, for years I've taught courses in um, positive power and influence, communication courses, basically, often cross cultural well, everything's cross-cultural, but, um, and in, in dealing with power and influence, um, the program that we have talks about different styles of communication. Uh, one is rational argument. I suggest that you do this because A, B, and C. Another approach to it is that of being assertive. I want you to come on over to my place tonight. If you come over, I will cook my very best laksa. And if you've never tasted it, you're in for a food gasm. Okay? I'm looking forward. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming already, everybody. <laughs> but okay, so that's that's a that's um, exchange. Then there is the most powerful one, which is attracting, and that's you know you and I have worked together for a number of years. We've been together on projects. Can you imagine how great it would be if we could use your talent and my editorial skills to create a game that would really tell people how to tell good stories? <laughs> okay? I can see people sitting around now, you know, saying, wow, this is so great that we can do tell stories and it feels very safe inside of a game and so on and so on. So, 
That, I that's mean. a very powerful. <laughs> huh? I've well, that's eaten. a very powerful. <laughs> yes, I've eaten it's very, definitely. Yeah. Yes, George, you, you cover so many themes uh, right now, and uh, I, I'm just thinking, you know, what to relate to first. So first of all, I would like to relate to uh, the roses you started with. You uh, talk a lot about the influence of your father, of your grandfather in mm -hmm. your life. And as I remember, uh both of us we have similar roots so to say mm -hmm. uh, so maybe uh, maybe you can uh, tell a little bit more about it in a second and uh, actually as for roses my great grandmother was a big big rose fan so to say and she oh. had a rose garden so she collected roses uh, mm -hmm. and i still remember playing in this garden because this is where i grew up uh, in south of Poland, and uh, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. So I can relate, you know, to to your uh, sharing regarding being in nature a lot because mm -hmm. this, is, this is these are my memories from the childhood. And by the way, as you were shaped very very much by strong men, I was shaped by very powerful women. So I grew up in a house where there were only women, my great grandmother, my grandmother and my mom. So I was the fourth generation. And of course, this is something that I would like to relate to right now when you are talking about this obviousness mm -hmm. yeah, of our world. This was my world of obviousness. So when I moved to Germany and I realized that this uh, image of a powerful woman maybe not necessarily fits the mainstream image here. And uh, that was a big, big surprise actually. And uh, it took a while to really, uh, you know, have the standing, I work. <laughs> uh, my working is also about traveling. And of course I go on projects abroad. And of course I, I can go to not only different European countries, but also offer intercultural programs, storytelling programs, uh, in India, in Malaysia, in uh, different European countries. And this is what I enjoyed so much. So, you know, so this world of obviousness is uh, something that uh, is like uh, swimming in the water. And as soon as uh, we are staying, remaining in just this one water, we have no idea and we don't even appreciate it because we don't see it. And this is exactly what happened uh, during the COVID time, because this is right now the third point I would like to relate to when you said that it was so obvious to everybody just to limit our intercultural uh, programs on how to shake and bow, shake hands and bow, yeah? Mm -hmm. During the COVID time, we don't shake hands any longer. We, we might bow, yes. And uh, this, is, uh, this is also something that uh, has changed and that has changed also our focus. And it- it, it Give me an elbow. It, yes, and it also <laughs> leads me to the, uh, to the uh, definition that, um, you know, I uh, was so much working with, the definition by Jerome Brunner, Mm -hmm. So the, the cultural psychologist working with stories a lot. And he actually said, culture is a set of stories that we enter. Mm -hmm. And um, I love it. I love it because, mm -hmm. you know, it's the one word definition. And it's not, not really necessarily uh, the, the whole truth, so to say. When I look at this disruption right now, but also when I look back at some experiences, in different cultures. I would say that culture is on one hand side, the set of stories that we enter, on the other hand side, the set of stories that we co-create. Mm -hmm. And right now during this uh, time, when we have moved to the virtual field, we see how important it is this to not only focus on business, but to talk about it, how we want to do business across cultures. So really, how do we actually want to work in global virtual teams? What does it mean to lead in such teams? So this is also what you um, yes, addressed uh, regarding, you know, um, the leadership idea and how we can proceed. 
and so on and oh, so forth. Uh, just to give an example of that, one of the games I've been working on is with uh, Cindy Egolf, who is a uh, uh, Cindy is a director or a, uh, of a uh, symphony orchestra, and she points out that we tend to take our models of leadership from sports or the military and other kinds of organizations like that, and she's suggesting that we look at music, the symphony, the ensemble, in how we play and direct together. And uh, it fits very much in with this idea of the, how music penetrates and, and aligns us as well. So that, that's an important topic. And I think one of the things that we, we interculturalists have, I mean, I, I said we want to go for the positive. But on the other hand, uh, we have been what we call conflict avoidance when it comes to the bigger issues, okay? There are topics that interculturists don't like to touch. Um, though religion has paid enormous amount in the lives and deaths of people in our own generation, nobody wants to talk about that, okay? And uh, so being, I, I have a picture of myself. Um, I, I went to Bratislava once and on the town square there's a, a bench with Napoleon leaning on it. And um, Napoleon, I, I'm saying to Napoleon, um, well, you know, uh, what's history? And he says, well, history is a collection of lies that all of us believe, that everybody believes, okay? And I bring that up because uh, along with what you said about Brunner, which is actually true, that's the dynamic of how we create the stories, but we create the stories for our own benefit. You know, they've always said history is, history is written by the winners. And now we're at a moment uh, where we're looking at history as everything is breaking apart and we're seeing the causes of the oppression, the, the issues, for example, that are about racism, which have risen to the top in our cultural discussions nowadays. And uh, what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of our idols have had clay feet. And it's not surprising that people are out uh, toppling statues and uh, it's kind of scary that the, this idea of cancel culture uh, has come about, not only to deal with historical figures who were once heroes and now uh, we see the negative side of them, but also uh, the damage that can be done to people in their real lives by bringing back their past sins. Huh? Now, no one of us can say, I don't think, there may be some really virtuous people around, but I've made mistakes in my early youth growing up, probably still make them now. But the point is, we need to have a culture where we can acknowledge, take responsibility, but also move on and, you know, not be the man I was 40 years ago, or maybe in some cases last week, it's, it's about learning from our experiences, and this is why we need to be familiar with our own stories as well as other people's. Exactly. Uh, this is about the narrative identity also, yeah? Now, the first book I ever wrote was uh, called Keeping Your Personal Journal. Mm. And I and friends of mine have kept journals for years and years and years. Um, uh, and um, it's very interesting because... It's, it's a way of telling your story to yourself, but also giving you, when you go back, the chance to examine it. Uh, about 10 years ago, I went back to my old home in California, which I've sold, and uh, I cleaned out a room where I had all of my old journals and papers and family treasures and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, trunk full of my mother's love letters and her old lingerie and stuff like that, which was really, it took me an entire month. To, I, I digitized everything I can because I wasn't going to, there was more stuff in that room that I could put in my apartment here if I intended to bring it back. So I digitized everything and sent the real objects to other people, friends who were involved or family and so on. But I discovered some interesting things. Number one is there were stories I was telling. I hope I'm not doing that right now, but there were stories that I was telling that when I look back in the journals or in letters or something, that ain't exactly the way it happened. 
So the challenge we are facing is, yes, we have our stories. We use our stories to survive and succeed. That's what culture is. It's yeah. the set of stories we use to survive and succeed in our environment. Now, when your environment is different from my environment, um, we can learn from each other's stories, but we also may see that, that the stories, there's, there's things there that uh, uh, are very different. And um, then we're, we, we need to begin to deal with how do we negotiate meaning and identity in this process? My latest game, I just finished the mini version of it the other day, is hold, your, hold on to your uh, seat. It's called Diversity Castration. Okay, sounds bad, doesn't it? But it's Diversity Cast, Race, and Shun. Mm -hmm. And it's about our capacity for shunning the real issues of caste and race and gender and so on and so forth. And I wrote it particularly because I want to deal, I'm, I'm very much concerned about the future of men, boys, okay? What's going on for men and boys is not good at this point. And uh, it, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of desperation in this process. So dealing with toxic masculinity, uh, you know, the, the, the situation of, of uh, uh, conflict, gender conflict, and um, the kind of real situations in which boys and men are trying to find a sense of purpose in a culture where they can escape from but also be trapped by the disposability of men. Mm -hmm. Men were human resources for making the machine of work happen. Okay? Yes, and that's exactly you see about wording also, yeah. Human yeah, of course, human resources <laughs> like oil general. or gas or to exploit, <laughs> to, yeah. Exploit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or in the military where they give their lives to protect you and me, mm -hmm. um, and then of course the provider. Yeah. Now, women are becoming, this is a wonderful thing. I think the feminist movement has done incredibly good things for women, and guys got to get on to what are the issues for them, just as women did. And it's, uh, you know, we got to climb out of just the blame of the toxic masculinity. There's nothing wrong with male virtues. They're wonderful. So part of my game is how do you use your accepted male virtues of strength and bravery and fearlessness and so on to enlarge your own personality, your own masculinity in a way that it's no longer toxic, but, but, but very, very, very powerful and useful for you and those around you. I mean, let's face it, um, uh, I just saw statistics for the UK uh, not too long ago, and as I recall, 80% of the suicides of people between ages 19 and 49 are men. And we all know that 99% of the time, mass killers are men. And I come from a culture in the U.S. where that pandemic is almost as bad as the pandemic with the COVID virus. I mean, every day or every other day, there is some kind of uh, shooting or, or a mass murder or something of that sort. Um, so at any rate, uh, understanding what the needs are. And I said the manly art of poetry, not that women can't write poetry. As I love Emily Dickinson. But uh, the point is, that's not been associated with us. I have a good buddy in Seatar who sends me a big, big bouquet of flowers for my birthday every year. And a point I've made and several other men have said is, real men send flowers. Wow. Okay. And, uh, but it's very interesting because there's this little suspicion but they suspect that we are probably gay because we send flowers, you know. So, and, you know, we just looked at a news, news, news headline the other day, Howard University gets rid of the liberal arts in its, in its program. And this is one of the things that Paul, Paul Schaefer, who I mentioned before, is pointing out is that 
if it doesn't contribute to your career, it shouldn't be part of your education. Yeah. Now, yeah. You know, I happened to grow up at a time <laughs> in another century way back then when I had four years of Latin and two years of Greek, classical Greek in high school. Okay, not not uh, not how to order tzatziki, but <laughs> how to this is Plato and Plato and all those guys back there in Aristotle. We 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 I memorized that. My absolute favorite poem of all times. Uh, I don't know who per, who establishes the correct pronunciation for these things, but it's Deducamena Salana Kiplaides. Messe de Nuptis, Ego de Monocateldo. It's from Sappho, and what it says is, it's the middle of the night, and the constellation has disappeared, and the moon is gone, and I lie alone in my bed. It's just a fragment from, from Sappho, but as always, I just said, wow, what a wonderful human reflection. So, uh, I'm an ally for women's rights and for feminism, and I want the same effort to go into redefining men's roles in a way that we deal with the, the structures that are making it toxic for them and making them uh, be labeled as toxic because they're trying to survive in this kind of environment. And there is one more question that uh, arises when I listen to uh, to you know your ideas about uh, male virtues and values because of course both of us we agree that they vary also from culture to culture mm -hmm. um, your uh, grandfather came originally from Poland mm -hmm. and what do you think uh, what was the confrontation of the idea of male being male in the Polish and US society, what did he actually um, consider the world of obviousness and uh, what well, kind an of interesting, did it have on the interesting question. and later on you? Was, uh, my grandfather who came from Warsaw, there was no Poland. Yeah. His favorite yeah. saying was, yeah. Poland was crucified between two thieves, huh? Russia and Germany. And he was a master blacksmith in the Russian army. So I did a reflection not too long ago about how did I get my masculinity? And so I had this one grandfather from Poland um, who really was a man who could build anything, you know, from, from chewing a horse uh, to creating uh, cabinets and closets and anything you wanted him to fix, he could fix. My other grandfather uh, came from uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, and uh, uh, I always tease about the name. I do a, a thing about the culture of names, uh, that I'm a phony, okay? I'm not Simons. I was born Simonovich, yep. but my father and my grandfather got tired of in the anti-immigrant feelings of those days toward Eastern Europeans, Central Europeans, and Catholics particularly, they got Simonovich, the son of a bitch, all the time. So they literally changed the name to Simons. And, um, but my other grandfather, uh, Anton, from, uh, he was born in Croatia, well, you know, it was all the Austro-Hungarian Empire back then, and he was a, a court tailor in Vienna. And he went to New York to study uh, style, and he stayed, okay? He stayed in the USA, opened his own tailor shop, Tony the Tailor, known by everybody as Tony the Tailor. And uh, he was really a guy who, uh, once again, um, made everything, huh? I mean, I don't think I had store-bought pants until I was about eight or nine years old. He made all our clothes, you know, mm -hmm. just like as well as doing his his business. So, and my father, who got hit by the depression, who had ambitions of becoming a doctor, became a medieval doctor, a barber. You know the barber pole. Yeah. yeah. You know. So anyway, 
there was my dad and the barber shop, and the barber shop uh, was a men's club. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's where there, it was a place for really for men, and we loved the, the. I mean, it was it was it was it was something that doesn't exist very much anymore. Except there are men's groups and things of that sort, but uh, that was where it was at, and uh, we were shocked when a woman opened a barber shop. Mm -hmm. And she called it Delilah's place. <laughs> you know the story of Samson and Delilah. <laughs> she cut off his hair and took all his strength away. So we don't know whether that was a, yeah. a <laughs> toxic feminist ploy or, or, or what. But um, at any rate, the, having those three men in my life on an everyday basis mm -hmm. gave me I, I didn't have to, you know, I, when I did men's groups later on, I was shocked as to how fatherless so many men were. Mm -hmm. And I had a triple dose of fathering. And it's influenced me not only in confidence about my masculinity, but I've realized that whatever I do, I do it like a sort of like a craftsman. You know, I'm not trying to say I'm, I'm really good at it, but I, you know, if I'm writing something, I, I do this and I tweak it up and I do it. It's just like my grandfather designing a piece of clothes or my other grandfather working on something uh, that he's creating. So I love this metaphor. Yeah. Huh? I love this metaphor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's just um, I'm definitely a hands-on kind of guy. I, I mean, uh, um, if you come to my apartment and I let you see more than as long as television screen, <laughs> you'll see all kinds of things that I have fixed. And my interns, and they sort of become fascinated with that sort of stuff. Um, mm. I've had interns in my intercultural business for a quarter of a century. Yeah. And I counted it up the other day. I've had people from 22 countries. And you yourself, you offered also uh, your services, intercultural programs, communication uh, trainings in 78 countries. So, wow. Oh, that's my last count, yeah. Yeah, um, this is amazing. So, um, I really look forward, George, that we see each other in person again. For real, yes. Yes, <laughs> uh, we will see where, <laughs> where in the world. And I'm very, very grateful for your insights uh, regarding this aspect of diversity. So the masculinity and male values, and also, you know, this combination of arts and storytelling. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what connects us. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. So um, come on over, I'll cook you my laksa. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost on my way. Just okay. two more projects and I'm coming. See you, George. Take care. Bye.